think I spoke on this maybe in March 30th. Do you still remember it a little bit? Or is it long gone from your memory? We looked at Galatians 6, uh, 7 through 10, but I want us to look at ver uh, Galatians 6, 7, and 8 this morning. And let's go ahead and put it up. Uh, if you'll remember, we talked about the agricultural laws and the stories and the examples and the symbolism throughout the Bible. In fact, the most famous parable of Jesus begins what? A sower went out to sow, or if you've got a modern translation, a farmer went out to plant. That's what a modern translation says. The most famous parable of Jesus and found in, found in the Gospels. And we read in Galatians, Paul follows up to the, to the principles of, of uh, sowing and reaping and planting and harvesting. And we looked at this last time. This is the new living. And he says, Do not, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. One of the things that I found when I looked at this was in the places where it says, don't be misled or don't be fooled or do not be deceived, the NIV says, do we have it in NIV also? Okay here, oh, okay, here we go. I Actually, in this one, I like the NIV just a little bit. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And this expression, do not be, be deceived or don't be fooled, is actually found in maybe five or six different places in the New Testament. And the context usually is don't fool yourself. That's really the, the meaning more. Don't, don't, it, it's not that you are being led astray by others who are preaching false doctrine, but it is in and of yourself. It's easy to fool yourself into thinking something. And so Paul says, God cannot be mocked. And we talked about that before. What does it mean? What does mock mean in this situation? Remember what it means? Okay, it means to turn up your nose, right? To turn up your nose. That's what the literal meaning is. And what it means symbolically is to pay no attention to or to disregard. And we often say, well, I would never mock God. If you talk with Christians or churchgoers, and we talked about this before, they would say, no, 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 I would never mock God. But Paul's very clear. Paul is talking to Christians here. And he says to them, don't be deceived. You cannot mock God. Christians are mocking God. They mock God when they disregard God's the, guideline, the guidelines and the rules, the laws that God gives us. He says, a man reaps what he sows, and so does a woman. <laughs> okay, this is the New Testament. When they say a man, it, uh, it was used in the Greek, and it referred to men and women both. Okay, so whenever you see that in the New Testament, ladies, don't think, well, you know what, this is just for men. They should pay attention. This is for us, okay? This is for men and for women. And he says, the one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Okay, let's go back to the New Living Translation translation again, and that gives us a little more insight. You will ar always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death. I don't want decay and death, do you? What type of harvest do you want in your life? How many of you got up and said, hey, I want a harvest of decay and death this week? <laughs> Anyone? Of course not. What do we want? How many of you want a harvest of everlasting life? Peace, joy, love, and things like that. Are those the things that you want to harvest in your life? That's what I want. Amen. Well, guess what? If those are the things we want to harvest, Paul says, using the principles of the Lord, then you have to plant for those things. People fool themselves. Christians fool themselves. We fool ourselves when we think, I can kind of live the way I want if nobody knows. I can do this and I can do that because it's not hurting anybody else and nobody really sees and it's my own life and it's my own business and I can spend my time this way and I can think this way and I can give my, my eyes to look at this and my ears to listen to this or whatever and it's okay, it doesn't matter. I can live the way I want. Don't Fool yourself, says Paul. If you do that, your harvest will be decay and death because that's the seed that you're planting when you do that. And so we look at, you know, so, so often we look at these things that I'm, that I'm talking about that they bring a momentary pleasure, don't they? they, they honestly, they do. They bring a short-term satisfaction, don't they, to our desires and to our natures. Well, it feels good, so I want to do it. 
I like the way it makes me feel. I like to listen to it. I like to hear it. I, I, they spoke to me like this. Well, I'll speak to them like that. There's a natural desire. And, and we do all of those things. But we fool ourselves because what we're doing with those things is we are planting seeds that will harvest what? Decay and death. So I encourage you as we look at this, rather than looking at what feels good right now, what do I want now? God help us to take the long-term view and ask ourselves and think about it, really think about it. What do I want to harvest? Not just what feels good right now, what does my nature want to do now, but God for the rest of my life and long term, what do I want my harvest to be? And then when I decide, and, and here's the thing, all of you laughed when I said, how many of you say, hey, I want a harvest of decay and death. You laughed because nobody wants that. I don't want that either. And yet sometimes those are the seeds I plant. They are. Those are the seeds I plant. And so God help us with the help of the Holy Spirit to not look just at what feels good now, what I want now, what I can do now, but to say, what do I want in my life? What harvest do I want in my life? And I want blessing. Don't you want blessing? Yes, we all want the blessing of the Lord. It doesn't just come with a simple little prayer, brothers and sisters. I, personally, I don't think it's just, oh, bless me, Lord. I don't think it's really that simple. But it comes as we say, God, I want your blessing in my life. God, I want your joy in my life. Lord, I want peace to rule and reign in my life. I want a peaceful family. I want a harmonious relationship with my husband or my wife. Then you know what we have to do? We have to start thinking about, then what seeds do I plant now so that I can have that harvest? Parents, you, your children that, are, that you're bringing up, that you're raising, and what a, 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 an, an appropriate message for Mother's Day, those of you who are mothers and fathers too. And you look at your children, what do you want for your children? Not just the concerns of right now, not just the pressures of now, not just what is needed now, not just what the world says, your children must be this. Your children must do this. Oh, for my children to be successful, they've got to do this, 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 and this. They should be involved in this, 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 and this. Parents, if that's how you consider investing in your children, then you're short-sighted. You're short-sighted, and you're letting the world shape the way you look at your children. Instead, parents... Look at your children and say, what do I want for my children? What is the best I can do for them? What is the best I can give them? And I want to tell you something right now. The best for your child is not to be number one in his class or her class. It's not. That's not the best. Do we want our children to do well in school? Sure we do. But that's not number one. That's for this world only. That's for this lifetime only. That's for a short time only. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But in my class, in high school, and in university, in the English department, I was the top student. I was the valedictorian. I was the number one graduate. But I want to tell you something. That was not because my parents said, now Jennifer, you've got big tests coming up and so we want you to stay home and study. And don't go to church today because you've really got to write your papers and you've got to do this and that. I know I might be stepping on toes just a little bit this morning, but I I'm speaking very sincerely to you. The principle of the Bible that my parents followed and that godly parents, you must do this if you want success in the right way in your children's lives. What does the Bible say? It's in the gospel, in the gospel of Matthew. Seek first, what? The kingdom of God. And all of these things will be added to you. In my life, the seeds that my parents planted were the seeds of God is a priority. And, and some of you, you, you're young now, I want to encourage you, put God first. Put God first. And sometimes we say, yeah, but I've got to do this and I've got to do that. Put God first 
and God will take care of those other things because God is the God of the harvest. He's responsible for the harvest. And parents, I think sometimes we get so uptight because we do live in a world that's, that's very, very uh, pressurized, don't we? And we do live in a very competitive world world, especially those of you who have kids growing up in Hong Kong, it's competitive here, isn't it? It's so competitive. But it's competitive in the Philippines too, isn't it? In Singapore, in Malaysia, in China, oh my goodness, in China, where so few are ever even able to go to university, the competition is so, so, so high. But I urge you and I encourage you, you have put God first in your lives, have you not? Generally speaking, those that I know you and I know your life, we have, as pastors, we have seen that in your lives. We have seen that you're putting God first, that you're making His ways a priority in your life. And that's true, and you're doing that. I urge you and I encourage you, both of us do. You have made these decisions in your own life. Do that for your children as well. That's the best thing you can do for them. That's the best thing you can do for them. Be an Abraham parent. I'm all over the place in my notes. Don't worry. In the second service, maybe it will be a little bit different. But I want to turn to Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. Be an Abraham parent. And I want to show you, I want, I want us to look at this verse. This is in the great chapter on faith. And it, we read about Abraham and it says, this is, has always been one of my favorite verses. It says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. Now you're probably saying, is this, a, is, this is about planting and, and harvesting? Yes, it is. Keep following with me. He went without knowing where he was going. Verse 9 says, even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith for he was like a foreigner living in tents. Now stop right there. So here's Abraham, this great father of faith, the one who the Bible says was what? A friend of God in the Old Testament, a friend of God, one who saw God face to face, one to whom God revealed his plans, one through whom God said, remember what he said? All the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. Wow! He must have been top of the heap. But look at what it says. He lived like a foreigner in tents. And then look at the very next sentence. And so did Isaac, his son, and what? Jacob, his grandson, who inherited the same promise. Verse 10, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. And when we look at this, you say, well, how does this relate to me? Be an Abraham parent. Abraham chose God first. And then, because he found God faithful, he planted good seeds in his son, Isaac, and his grandson, Jacob. And he chose for them, too. And he said, I live in a tent because I have something better. I'm looking for that city with foundation whose builder and maker is God. Abraham's eyes and Abraham's faith and Abraham's hope and Abraham's planting went beyond the temporary things of this world and into eternity, which will be for eternity and for forever. And when Abraham made that choice for himself, he knew it was a good choice. And because of his influence with his family, his children and his, his child, Isaac, and then, and his grandchildren as well. He made the same choice for them. Parents, those of you who are Christians and who have, you have children and you're bringing them up in the ways of the Lord, you have chosen to follow God. You have chosen the best things of God for yourself. If it's a good choice for you, it's a good choice for your children. If you have found God faithful, plant those seeds in your children's lives as well. Be an Abraham parent. Don't let the world around you squeeze you in its mold. Romans 12. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let me just flip over there very, very quickly. I love this. I, I love this, this passage in Romans 12, 2. 
This is the Phillips translation, and it's one of my favorites. Uh, the New Living says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. But this is the one that I really like. The Phillips paraphrase says what? Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. But let God remold your minds from within. Parents, I encourage you. There is pressure, and not just parents, but this is true in every area. I'm, I'm focusing on parents and mothers this morning because this is Mother's Day. But this truth is applicable in every area of our lives. It truly is. There's the pressure of the world around us. Do it this way. Those of you who are parents, you know the pressure you have to, uh, for, your, for your children. You know the pressures that come on Sundays, right? Sundays which are the Lord's Day, Sundays when whatever. And let me ask you something, parents. How many of the schools that your kids are part of plan extra activities on Sunday? On Sunday, how many? All the time, right? All the time, all the time. I, I want to challenge you. Don't think like the world. Don't let the pressure of the world change the way you bring up your children. Don't suddenly change priorities for your kids as you bring them up. Let, don't let the world around you squeeze you in its mold. And sometimes parents, you feel, my kids will lose out if they're not involved. My kids will be whatever. I don't believe they will. I don't believe they will. God takes care of the other things. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Be an Abraham parent. Be an Abraham person in every area of your life. Look beyond the temporary things of this world to the eternal things. In Philippians 3, uh, Philippians 3, 19 and 20, their mind is on earthly things. This is the Phillips paraphrase again, and I want you to see this is, this is the last part of Philippians chapter 3. Uh, NIV says, their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. Now look at the Phillips again. Let's go to that, and I want you to pull out this. Uh, look at this. I love this. Paul was talking about people, Christians, church people, who were plugged in to this world and this world system. And what did he say? He said, this world is the limit of their horizon. And brothers and sisters, how sad it is if you and I, as Christians, have as our limit this world. This world is the limit of our horizon. God has made us eternal. And when we plant, we plant seeds that will bring forth what? Eternal life. Don't let this world be the limit of your horizon with your children, with your husbands, with your wives, in your work, in your business. You are a child of God. You are a citizen of heaven. Plant seeds in your life that will produce eternal fruit. Not a harvest that is for this world only. Not a harvest of decay and death. Because brothers and sisters, honestly, if you plant fruit that is for this life only, it is a harvest of decay and death. It is. It is. But get your eyes on the horizon that goes beyond this world. Be an Abraham parent. Be an Abraham person. And plant seeds that will produce eternal fruit. Now I want to talk for just a minute to mothers who are here and you have children in other countries. I know this is sensitive, but I want to say it anyhow. You are here and you're working to make a better life for your family, yes or no? Yes. You are here to provide a better life for your children, yes or no? Yes. yes. I am single and I have no children, so I am Yes, Dalen. I'm, she says, really? I said, yes. <laughs> it was somebody, I have two kitty cats. <laughs> but, but they're not going to heaven. <laughs> so I have made other investments. I've planted spiritual seeds. Don't worry. I have spiritual kids. I have spiritual kids. I really do. And you are some of them. But I, I do want to say something, all joking aside, to those of you who have children and family members in other countries, and especially the Philippines, because so many of you are from the Philippines. And you're Christians, and you're working to make a better life for your kids and for your family. What do you do and how do you handle some of these verses when you look at your responsibilities 
you're a child of God, and yet you have these responsibilities. How do you balance? And I know at times it tears your heart, doesn't it? What I want to urge you is this. I don't have all the answers, and I don't know how it all works out, but I do know that God has answers in this area. What I want to say to you is this. Don't let your primary investment in your children and in your family be financial and material. Do not let that be the primary investment. And you say, but I send finances back every month so that they can go to school, so that they can have clothes, so that they can eat, so that we can have a house. I understand that. I understand that. But don't let that be number one between you and your children and your family. Don't let it be number one. Plant seeds. You say, but I'm not there. No, you're not there, but you can pray. And plant seeds in prayer. Plant seeds through prayer. You say, God, I have to be here. It seems I have to be here for the sake of my family and for the sake of my children. And others of you, it's not just those of you who are from the Philippines. There are others of us who have, who have similar things. I feel that way at times, although I have no children, with friends and family that are in the States. And you may feel that way in Uganda as well. You can still plant seeds through prayer that will bring eternal life, that will bring forth fruit. I remember years ago, uh, the very first helper that we had in our house was uh, Cheryl. And we had a helper because Sister Betty had a job, you know. And um, so we hired, we, uh, Betty signed Cheryl. Cheryl, when she came to work for us, was absolutely not a Christian. Absolutely not. And uh, she had lived and worked in Hong Kong for 17 years. That's a long time. Her husband was in the Philippines, and her husband said, please come home. We'll make do. We'll make do. Please come home. But Cheryl was determined, I'm going to have a good life for my family. We're going to have a house. We're going to buy land. We're going to do these things. And these are things that are good that we, we are to provide for our families. And she had, had a son that she barely knew because uh, he was 16 years old. She, she'd had him, and then she'd come back to, the, to Hong Kong to work. And um, the son was being raised by, grand, by the grandparent, by her parents, or by his parents, I think. But they weren't Christians either. And Cheryl was not a Christian. And then, after working for us for about two years, Cheryl became a Christian. Truly became a Christian, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and she suddenly began to realize the importance of her family. And the importance of passing on, planting good seeds. And, and producing good spiritual fruit from their lives. Let me tell you what she started doing. She was still here working for us in Hong Kong, but she went out, and you know what she started doing with some of her money? Not all of it. Some of her money. She started buying phone cards. And you know what she did? Every single night, every night, for about 15 minutes, after she became a Christian, it started from the first week, she would call her family and she would talk with her husband and she would talk with her son about 15 minutes every single night for a year and a half until she finally returned to the Philippines. And her husband and her son are Christians today. Her parents, his parents, are Christians today. Why? Because she became an Abraham parent and she started planting good seeds. Brothers and sisters, there's so much more here and I hope the Holy Spirit is speaking, has spoken to your heart. It's not just for parents. Please don't be angry at me. I, are you angry at me? I was kind and gentle, wasn't I? I do believe I was. God does have answers for your difficult situations. But if you will seek Him first, and if you will determine in your heart, I'm going to be an Abraham parent. I'm going to be an Abraham person. I'm going to set my eyes on eternal things. Then that will determine the seeds that you plant now. And when it determines what seeds you plant, it will determine what harvest you will reap in the future. I want a good harvest. 
don't you? We want a good harvest. Plant the seeds now that will bring a good harvest later. It's worth it. Is it harder to plant good seeds? Yes, it is. Is it easier to plant bad seeds? Yes, it is. But oh, the reaping, the harvesting of good seeds brings joy to our hearts. Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that in your word you have warned us and you have encouraged us. You've given us a direction. Lord, I pray that each one of us, we would be Abraham people. We would be Abraham parents. That we would look beyond the pressures of this world and the voice of the world that says, do it this way if you want to succeed. Do it this way if you want to get ahead. Do it this way if you want to prosper. Instead, O oh God, may your Holy Spirit transform us from within and make us into the people you want us to be that we might plant good seeds for a good harvest, for an eternal harvest. Lord, I pray you would help us to do that in our families, with our children, with our work, in our relationships with one another, in church and outside of church. Lord, help us to plant good seeds that there might be a harvest as we look to the Philippines and the medical mission and the summer English camp coming up and all of these other areas where you as the Lord of the harvest have said to us, the fields are white. Oh God, may we partner with you and labor with you and plant good seeds that a harvest might be reaped for your glory for all eternity. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.